Welcome to Mohan Murali Kanalahari. This is a special show today. I have the pleasure of having Professor Rajiv Malhotraji here in my studio. Rajiv ji, welcome. Uh, for those of you who do not know who Rajiv Malhotraji is, uh, I would like to describe him as a soldier for Hindu Dharma. Is that a fair characterization, sir? Well, soldier is sort of doing a physical thing. I'm doing an intellectual battle. Uh, so I'm more of a intellectual uh, strategist, scholar, fighter. Intellectual scholar, strategist, scholar, fighter. Okay. Uh, Raji Malhotra, Raji Malhotra ji is uh, a, is a well-known author, and he has written several books, and the most recent of which is Breaking India. And uh, he, he, we also have in the studio here Sant Gupta ji, who's also uh, who's a, who's a local and who's a He's the president of uh, local Durga Mandir, and uh, he's also he, he was uh, he was on the U UN panel for interfaith dialogue, in which uh, he presented the sustainable development f from the Hindu perspective. So, mm -hmm. Santi, would you mind uh, uh, giving a little bit introduction of our guest? Sure. Uh, good morning or afternoon. Uh, this is Sant Gupta. So, to tell you a little bit about uh, Raji Malhotra. He is an American, an Indian American uh, researcher, writer, speaker, and public intellectual on current affairs as they relate to civilization, cross cultural encounters, religion, and science. Rajiv Ji has conducted original research in a variety of fields and has influenced many other thinkers in India and the West. He has, in fact, disrupted the mainstream thought process among academic and non-academic intellectuals alike by providing fresh, provocative positions on Dharma and on India. Rajiv has written several bestsellers, and starting with uh, Being Different, an Indian Challenge to Western U Universalism, Breaking India, Western Intervention in Dravidian and Dalit Fault Line, and most recently, Indra's Net, Defining Hinduism's Philosophical Unity. He is currently a full-time founder director of Infinity Foundation in Princeton, New Jersey. He also serves as chairman of the Board of Governors of the Center for Indic Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth, and as an advisor to various organizations. The foundation has given more than 400 grants for research, education, and community work. The Infinity Foundation has provided small grants to major universities in support of programs, including visiting professors in Indic studies at Harvard University, yoga, Hindi classes at Rutgers University, the research and teaching of non-dualistic philosophies at the University of Hawaii, Global Renaissance Institute, and the Center for Buddhist Studies at Columbia University. I have followed Rajiv Ji's work for a number of years, and he has given us a very fresh outlook on what our faith is all about and how it has been treated in the West for a very long time. His ideas are thought-provoking, and we look forward to a good discussion this afternoon so that you can ask any questions about the things that he has written. You can follow him on Twitter. You can follow him on rajimalhotra.com, and you can get a lot more details about his work, his books, and his thoughts. Rajiji, welcome. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, what is breaking India? Is it a confluence of self-interest forces coming to break India, or is it an outright collusion or conspiracy? Well, uh, first, I to go in chronological sequence. I should start with my first book, which wasn't named by anybody. I should. Mm -hmm. It's called Invading the Sacred. Invading the Sacred was a book which is the result of 10 years of battles and debates I had with the Western Academy mm. who study Hinduism. And they make fun of Hindu deities. They say that Ganesh is a limp phallus and Ramakrishna was a pedophile, had a homosexual relationship, and Shiva encourages rapes. And so a whole lot of uh, what they've done is used Freud, Freudian psychoanalysis, which is used for patients, people who have a disease, mental who have disorder, mm -hmm. and they try to Freudian psychoanalyze the Hindu deities and Hindu symbols and gurus and so on. And this became very, very fashionable. And so I took this on as not an authentic representation. And just for the record, I've never tried to 
block the other side from talking or publishing or writing. Uh, never encourage people to go and uh, you know try to stop them. What I have tried to do is counter produce a counter discourse and make it popular. And it is they who've been blocking me, trying to speak and and so on by smearing and things like that. So that was my first book, and that was uh, that was the beginning of a large scale waking up of the Hindu diaspora in this country. Until then, the Hindu leaders in this country, both the political type and the religious type, were not interested in these kind of problems. They were thinking that we're doing very well. We have a lot of temples. Everything is going very well. In fact, when I raised these issues, a lot of people said to me, it doesn't matter. Why are you, why are you raising issues that don't even count? We have the truth inside us, and we are, doing so, we are so successful. But you know, 20 years later, those are the problems that every Hindu is now worrying about. And I, I raised them with no help or support. And uh, even after I raised them, people were really not uh, interested in uh, joining this. It took me a lot of running around and a lot of risk taking, a lot of combating intellectually to get Hindus woken up. So that was a, an important milestone uh, book. and who are looking for sponsorship and support got it from the West. Mm -hmm. However it started, the point is now, both of them are working together. Mm -hmm. So both the points that you're saying are working together. So this is uh, exceedingly dangerous to India's sovereignty, India's integrity, and India's survival. Mm -hmm. And uh, the purpose of this book is to heighten the awareness so that more people can talk about it and start looking for these kind of symptoms and then discuss what we should do as a nation. Uh, uh, to all the listeners and uh, people who are watching on YouTube, I uh, I have a, a small announcement here. We take phone calls uh, on this show. This is um, the na name of the show. For those of you who are first time listening to this show, the name of the show is Mohan Marli Ganala Hari. This has been a radio show uh, which is on air in Telugu language for the last seven years. And I, I have occasionally done interviews in Engli English as well. And I personally, uh, I mean, I might need a little bit of introduction here for the new uh, new listeners, those who knew, uh, tuned in new. I'm a professor at George Mason University, and I do I do this as a passion. And uh, with that said, there is a phone uh, phone number that you can reach us, which is two zero one three four zero one nine five zero, and two zero one three four zero one nine five zero. And we will take calls uh, a little after 12:30 Eastern. Uh, so please, uh, please stay tuned and have your questions ready. And uh, Raji Malhotraji likes uh, likes to answer any kind of pointed questions, and he does not back away from a controversy. So please, uh, uh, please have your questions ready. Uh, Rajuji, uh, the second thing is uh, you you are you. You describe yourself as an intellectual kshatriya. Uh, is there a is there a, a utopian world for uh, intellectual kshatriya for uh, Hindu Hindus and Hindu dharma? Is there a utopian world where you see uh, this is the ultimate goal of where your battle is headed? No, I, I <coughs> certainly do not see us going back in time to the Vedic past. I'm not one of those who says there was a perfect past and we should go back to it. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of reasons it's not practical to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, the Vedic uh, era population was very small, maybe 2 million, 5 million for the whole subcontinent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, So you cannot have 1.5 billion people, you mm -hmm. know, 50 to 100 times as many population mm -hmm. density and have the same solutions. There was more water. Uh, you didn't need organized uh, you know, high intensity industry or farming and things of that sort. Uh, and uh, plenty of natural resources and not so much consumption. So uh, unless you want to scale down the population to a very small amount, you mm -hmm. really need new kinds of solutions. Plus, people want the modern technology, and I don't believe that Hinduism and Dharma are anti-modernity or anti-technology. Uh, so I feel that there is no the utopia is not going back to the past. But I feel that, uh, to me, the process of going forward is what is important, not the process of going back. And the process of going forward, I wanted to use some of the dharmic paradigms. I want to use use some of the Hindu heritage 
as a solution kit, as a toolkit uh, for sustainability, for environmentalism, for healing paradigms, for mm -hmm. spiritual well-being of the person, for mental health, for harmony, for pluralism. There are a lot of solutions that are available in our in our culture. And the, the fight I'm waging is that in the name of Western universalism, that the West has all the answers. I'm part of that yeah. system. And I was, I was raised like that, mm -hmm. but I didn't lose my, I was raised dual. I, my schooling was in Western thought and mm -hmm. in a Western, uh, Western style, English style education. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm a product of West, a success in the, in the United States, but I never lost touch with my so country. So Macaulay... As, as we, what do we call it? Macaulay, slaves of Macaulay system? Of Macaulay, but that's a misnomer because uh, 15, 20 years before Macaulay did what he did, mm -hmm. Ram Mohan Roy wrote to the British Parliament asking them to come and take over Indian education. Mm -hmm. This is not well known. But Ram Mohan Roy is the one who started inviting the British to redo Indian education and uh, anglicize it because he thought it was modern and better and superior for us. His inferiority complex is what opened the door. British got very encouraged that this very high class, well known, uh, high profile uh, Hindu has joined us in a sense. And so uh, that opened the door and then Macaulay comes later. But the product of, we are 150 years after all that, uh, you know, uh, seeing the results of what they did. Uh, the, you, you mentioned something like, you, you used a phrase in one of your uh, earlier videos, I, I don't know which one, I, I watched uh, uh, some of them. Uh, you said you're not against modernization, but you're against westernization. Is, yes. that, is that a fair yes. characterization? What I say is that we want dharmic modernity, mm -hmm. dharma and modernity, mm -hmm. like the Chinese have Confucian thought, which is their old traditional thousands of years old philosophical system, mm -hmm. and they're saying we're not leaving that, but we're becoming modern. We're becoming modern without becoming Western. So modern is technology, what we are using now, uh, modern medicine, modern mm -hmm. systems, you know, all the things that the uh, modernity has to offer. But you do not have to adopt Western values. And you do not have to take the Western uh, flow of history and say that our history should go, should go in that direction. The problem with Westernization is that Westernization, Western thought thinks that it is the leader of the world. That, is, that was started by the German philosopher Hegel. And he said that where we are today is where we want the rest of the world to be tomorrow. So in other words, we'll always be ahead of you. And where you are today is where we were yesterday. Oh. So, so uh, you are like our past. And we are like your future. So this, this asymmetry of West being ahead mm -hmm. uh, is very dangerous. And it, it also has destroyed cultures. It has destroyed civilizations, like the, what they did to the Native Americans, what they did to the Africans, to the pagans. The, digesting and destroying uh, anything that is different than them is kind of an expansionist idea. And so I'm against that. OK. Uh, you, you mentioned Western values. Uh, there is this notion that well, I I I buy subscribe to that notion. Take good wherever it is. It's a is that a absolute no to Western values? No, no, West has got a lot of good things to do. West has huge amount of uh, good things we should borrow. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the Western teamwork, mm -hmm. uh, Western uh, compliance with rules is mm -hmm. a very important thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we are more comfortable with chaos and disorder. We, it should it's okay, but that doesn't mean that we can, we do not have order. Mm -hmm. We need a good balance between the two. And the West has good institutions. The institutions in the United States and in Europe are exceedingly good. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, in our culture, it tends to be a personality cult. So when the guru dies or when a leader dies of a party, things fall apart mm -hmm. because there is no institution which is impersonal. Mm -hmm. In the West, Pope can die, it doesn't matter. Pope could have a scandal, he could be thrown out, the church will go on. Mm -hmm. And that's true of, you know, whether it's a, a Pope kind of a deal or whether it's IBM or whether it's a government, it is not a personality, uh, it is not based on a single personality. Mm -hmm. So we are too fragile institutionally and too much dependent on uh, an individual personality's charisma, charm, and his ability to hang, th hold things together. So there are so many things I can talk about the West, mm -hmm. which are very good. But what we are copying from the West are not the good things. We are copying smoking. Uh, India is one of the fastest smoking growing countries in the world. Mm -hmm. While United States smoking is coming down. India is one of the fastest uh, meat consuming countries in the world, one of the largest meat consuming countries in the world. Whereas in the United States, vegetarian is increasing. Vegetarianism is increasing. Uh, India is one of the fastest uh, beef exporting countries, one of the biggest beef, beef exporting countries, whereas here there's a campaign against uh, red meats. So, you know, you would find that the West is picking some good habits from India, like vegetarianism, like yoga, yoga like meditation. Yeah. yeah, and we're picking some of their bad habits. 
So that is what concerns me, that westernization, as has been popularized by the media, and the Indian medical establishment is encouraging people to eat meat because it's good for protein, but the American me medical establishment is discouraging from eating meat and asking them to become vegetarians. So, you know, it, the, the trade between the two is not an equal trade. We're picking up bad things. The U.S. cigarette companies think Asia is the biggest market for cigarettes, mm -hmm. while here there's a lot of pressure to get rid of them and a lot of lawsuits against them because of all the problems they're solving. So in India, there is an, this is the result of an inferiority complex. Indians suffer this complex that we are somehow inferior, and to become superior, we've got to westernize, we've got to copy. So what they do is they copy the easy stuff, whatever is available in pop culture, the symbolism, mm -hmm. and uh, movies, and all of that stuff. And the Indians who come back from the West with a tapa, you know, with a stamp, with a, some kind of a certification, mm -hmm. they become big shots in India, and they create this kind of uh, effect the mimicry effect, mimicry of the whites, I call it white mimicry, which Indians want to do. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is the problem. Uh, it, uh, it, it's a follow-up question on something you said earlier. Uh, Freudian psychoanalysis of deities, you said deities are the followers of the deities. Both. The deities themselves are considered to be uh, uh, psychotic and uh, something mentally wrong with them. Mm -hmm. So uh, Shiva, there's a lot of psychoanalysis of Shiva, a lot of psychoanalysis of Durga and the goddess, uh, you know. Uh, uh, there's a lot of psychoanalysis of uh, Ganesh. There's a lot of psychoanalysis of Krishna. Uh, the uh, book says that because he's standing with like this with his body curved, that these are called cocked hips, so he's a homosexual, he's offering his himself for homosexual. This kind of a analysis is has become very popular. And my book did not end it, but it really put this on the on the on the on, on the table. Mm -hmm. And the people who are principal people doing it have stopped doing it, not totally stopped doing it, but kind of become more subtle. So one of the one of the prominent names that comes up and you actually had um, um, had taken her to task as Winnie Donner. Yeah. Uh, and could you uh, brief, uh, briefly tell us about what that... Uh, okay, so what Wendy, her Wendy Doniger is actually a very well-known scholar. She mm -hmm. knows, she studied Sanskrit. You can't say she's a fool or she's ignorant. She's not. She's exceedingly intelligent. Mm -hmm. uh, she's not a fool. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't say she's ignorant because she's studied very hard. She's more learned, knows more about Indian texts than 99% of Hindus do. Uh, but her the twist comes not because of lack of competence, but mm -hmm. the way she's used her competence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she's she's become very fashionable in this Freudian use, the use of Freudianism to understand Hinduism or to deconstruct Hinduism. Mm -hmm. So the whole business of turning Hinduism into myth, mm -hmm. uh, that it's all a myth, and and all these are myths that Hindus are part of. They're trapped in this myth, and they need to be saved or rescued from their myth. Unfortunately, it's been taken up by Indian Hindu myth makers like uh, Dev Dev uh, Dev uh, Dev Patnaik. Uh, uh, he's uh, there are others like that. They're making bestsellers, yeah, and, nice. and 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 a lot of uh, Hindus buying these books and patronizing them. And so the idea of uh, turning our whole civilization into some kind of mythology mm -hmm. has become very fashionable. And she's one of the pioneers who started this. So I have taken her on. Never wanted, never in my life asked that the book be burnt or banned or whatever. Mm -hmm. I just want that my discourse, which is, I've written thousands of pages, but I've, I've used the internet and I've used blogs and I've used YouTubes to get my point across. But what she controls is her friends, her students, her followers have a whole cabal to boycott and blacklist people like me who are an opposing voice. Mm. So in important forums, in important media, now why am I talking to internet radio? Mm. I'm happy because you're an innovative guy, I'm happy to be here. Mm. But mainstream television channels who are discussing this controversy have not invited me. They've invited either Wendy Doniger's side or those Hindus who are not well informed, who just have a big ego, who want to go and show off that they are so, the, they put their face, but they are not so well read. Let, let me guess, is this Fox News? <laughs> well, no, no, I'm talking about Indian TV. Yeah. Uh, uh, NPR. Uh -huh. I'm talking about New York Times. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Wall Street, uh, Wall Street Journal. Wall Street. They all had articles. Not one of them wanted to hear my point of view. Mm -hmm. Not one of them contacted me. I have written books on it. I have had 15 years of arguments on it. Mm -hmm. but. Rather than saying, okay, we believe in free speech on both sides, mm -hmm. they're championing the free speech of one, but by boycotting me, by eliminating me, by coming up with all kinds of excuses why we don't want you, mm -hmm. they're actually showing that they are against the real spirit of free speech. Uh, so I think that this free speech is a hoax. <laughs> I think that this intellectual freedom is a hoax. It means that the power belongs to the guy who owns the, who controls the microphone. And if he controls the microphone and says, you will speak and you won't speak, and he's got the power, 
and he may be uh, driven by incentives. He may be driven by uh, profit, 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 money, uh, who networks, friends, ego. prestige, ego, all of that stuff. Future opportunities. So all this is called free speech. It is a hoax. So uh, there is one more follow-up question about that. And I do thing. want to say that thanks to the internet mm -hmm. and all the things of the internet. I'm able to say, and I'm able to start this mobilization against the old school media mm -hmm. and the old school ideologies. Okay, uh, one one more follow up question on this, and then we can uh, okay. maybe for five minutes open for calls, and then I I have other questions to ask you. Uh, the question follow up question came up about uh, is when when you were mentioning about Western values. In the Western values, uh, you mentioned uh, well mentioning about like. Uh, Basically, Native Americans got destroyed by the whites who, who came to this country. And there has been some literature out there. I haven't, I mean, I had to plead ignorance here. I haven't seen a whole lot of that. But there were, uh, there were some people who say, like, in the name of Hinduism, like millions of millions of people have been killed, and Hindus are the most uh, culprit to... In, in 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 the in terms of genocide, I mean, what do you this say is, to that? This is so amazing that these people mm. will not allow counter voice like mine to come and debate them. Mm. They can, but because they control the channels of information flow, they can mm. say anything, and they can come up with whatever they want to. But this is all nonsense. It is the 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 point is. Anytime there is anything, it is blamed on Hinduism. Mm -hmm. But anytime there is something in, in the Western world, you don't blame it on Christianity. You don't blame Hitler on Christianity, although he was he thought he's a Christian and doing something for Christianity. Mm -hmm. you know, the Christian genocide is not considered to be a pathological uh, problem with Christianity per se. Even Islam, with, with, despite all the stuff that's going on, there is a huge uh, attempt by leftist Americans, or leftist Westerners, to say that this is not because of Islam, there's only five bad people, there's only maybe 50 bad people, or maybe it's our fault, we're occupying their lands, or maybe we, they are not rich enough, which although they are, they've got the more oil and they're very mm -hmm. rich people. So there's always this attempt to not link problems with the religion mm -hmm. of the Abrahamic site, mm -hmm. of the Abrahamic tradition. But there's a problem of any time, any problem, if there's poor people starving, even though the British may have created this holo, uh, holocaust, mm -hmm. it is because they're Hindus. Mm -hmm. If there is some issue going on, any issue, whether it is, uh, whatever the problems are in India, it mm -hmm. is because of their religion is bad. Mm -hmm. Now, this is called atrocity literature. Mm -hmm. It's called, it is a Western term. Uh, they created this concept of atrocity literature. And so they showed the atrocities of the Mexicans in order to invade Mexico, that they are a bunch of atrocities. Mm -hmm. They showed the atrocities of Native Americans, that they are bad with their women, which is not true. And they, you know, or they are, they are uh, animal uh, sacrificing and human sacrificing, which is not true, it, as an excuse to go take over the land. The so most recent one is Iraq. Iraq was based on atrocity literature. The atrocity literature was hand in hand with invasion. Mm -hmm. And first comes the intellectual invasion through atrocity literature. Mm -hmm. And you create a, like the Jews, there was a, a, Hitler created atrocity literature against Jews. Uh, five years or more before they started actually persecuting them and holocaust. Mm -hmm. So the atrocity literature in India is what you are citing. Mm -hmm. This is atrocity and the unfortunate thing is Indians have joined into this atrocity literature mm -hmm. development. If you want to read about my, my views on atrocity literature in Breaking India, I have a lot to say. Mm -hmm. I've also uh, written a chapter in a book called Beyond Eurocentrism. It was published by Palgrave Mac Macmillan. Mm -hmm. And I have a chapter, large 40-50 page chapter called American exceptionalism and the myth of the frontiers. Mm -hmm. I'm showing how Americans thinking they are the exceptional people mm -hmm. have always considered that there are these dangerous frontiers we have to take over and there are savages living there mm -hmm. and we have to expand and civilize them. Actually, it's after natural resources. They want expansion of land and other natural resources. And to justify that, they always created uh, atrocity literature. Mm -hmm. They created atrocity literature in Vietnam. They created that this is a terrorist guy, all bad kind of people, communists, we have to go help them. They created uh, atrocity literature in Korea, in the Korean War. In Philippines, uh, the, all the American magazines and newspapers, mainstream ones, mm -hmm. were writing about the horrors of the Philippine culture when the Americans were invading during the, you know, 100 some years ago. Mm -hmm. So every uh, expansionism, uh, whether it is within the continental United States, whether it is the invasion of Mexico, whether it is overseas, whether all the way down to Iraq, mm -hmm. it is accompanied by atrocity literature of who those people are and they are a bunch of savages. Mm -hmm. So we are civilized, they are savages. So this whole business of what, what's wrong with Hindus mm -hmm. has to be seen in, as part of that range and Indians are contributing big time to the atrocity literature database of the United States 
CIA has this database. So one day if they want to do something and say we are doing it for the human rights, there are women being burned and there are Dalits being burned and there are children who to be saved from child labor. Like that, they can turn on, push a button and CNN and Fox and all these kind of people will be blasting atrocity literature of India for a month. And then there'll be congressional hearings and then they'll be, okay, we got to put sanctions and we got to put troops there. If they wanted to do that, that game has been the, the, the ground rule, the ground for playing that game has been prepared. Actually, I do have a, a question on that one. I want to save that for the last. Uh, yeah. uh, but uh, uh, for the audience out there, uh, we, are, um, we are going to take some phone calls. Phone number to call is... Two zero one three four zero one nine five zero. If you are in India, zero four zero zero four zero six six seven seven eight four zero three zero four zero six six seven seven eight four zero three. I actually forgot to introduce my colleague here. Uh, uh, Bhanu, would you come to, come to the front? Uh, Bhanu Prakash, uh, for the uh, come to the front of the camera there. So. Uh, Bhanu Prakash uh, earlier, uh, I mean, uh, he has been instrumental in setting up this interview. Actually, Bhanu Prakash is uh, uh, a is a show host in Telugu on Taranga. So he he hosts a show on uh, Techy Talk. Uh, actually, he's into Hindu Dharma and uh, quite a bit. Uh, having said that, the the phone calls will be taken, and if you have any question on uh, Twitter of Rajiv Mahotraji's uh, Twitter account or on Taranga Facebook group, anywhere you can post the question and uh, we are going to take those questions. And as we continue, as we continue with our conversation, we can, uh, uh, we can take one or two calls and then we will continue the, with the, uh, we have a, yes, we have a caller. Yes, we will take the call. Yeah, Kiran, uh, go ahead and take the call. Yeah. Hello. Welcome to Taranga, who's, uh, Who's this? Hello? Kiran, I can't hear you. We can't we can't hear the call. Oh, I'm yeah, yeah, we can hear now. Yeah, go ahead. From uh, uh excuse me? Um, it's a little, uh, little low. The voice is a little low. Kiran, can you increase the volume a little bit from your side? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Bhardwaj, and uh, I'm calling from Finland area. Oh, Bhardwaj, go ahead, sir. Uh, hi, Namaste, Rajiji. Namaste. Uh, I've been uh, uh, hearing a lot about you, and in fact, I've read a couple of uh, articles written by you on the as well. Um, I don't want to take too much time to say no, this is actually one of our first calls. Um, the only thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, you know, you spoke about uh, Wendy and her book. Uh, um, I see that as uh, more of a symptom than a cause. Uh, I feel that, you know, the, the root cause lies somewhere towards the east, uh, right in uh, the Ivy League, Harvard. So uh, talking of uh, the atrocity in literature, I feel that uh, people like uh, Professor uh, Wigzel, supported by you know, Professor Harper, Ramila Harper, are uh, one of the main uh, contributors to this. So if one were to counter, I think I personally think that you know like that's where uh, uh, you know, the corrective action or a curative action, whatever you call, it, should start. What are your thoughts on this? Should I repeat the question? So the gentleman is asking that uh, uh, rather that uh, if if you want to find out, the, uh, he thinks that the nexus, the uh, central point of all the atrocity literature, is one professor Witzel in Harvard uh, because uh, he's supporting uh, Ramila Thapar. Well, you see, the point is that when you have a war zone, when you have a uh, when you have a Kurukshetra, there are a lot of battles going on. It is not like one ship here is attacking us. There's also tanks and there's also air force. There's many, many parts of the war going on. So uh, there are, uh, I would think that uh, uh, this battle on uh, uh, Aryan theory is no longer with cell people. This is a 20 year old obsolete idea like saying that JNU is the center of all the problems because in India, you know, there are 20 universities worse than JNU in terms of spreading this kind of knowledge. Those are old ideas. 
Witzel is depleted. He's not an active publisher. He's not holding great conferences. He's not really. He, he did something long ago, and so people started fighting him. But you find many, uh, many people in the American and Western mainstream and in India who believe in these things. Uh, who uh, and by the way, Witzel did not start this Aryan theory idea. It was started way back in the time of uh, uh, you know uh, this guy, the German, what the famous. Uh, uh, Anyway, uh, Max Miller, Max Miller right, yeah, uh, and, and you know people have been uh, following this for all the time. And Indian scholars, when Majumdar was toppled by, uh, uh, you know, as a historian, primary, primary historian by Romila Thapar, it was not because of uh, Witzel. Uh, and you know, you see the whole Indian left is like that. They believe in this kind of an idea as, as a class struggle between Aryans and Dravidians and so on. You believe the church is uh, Witzel is a Jewish guy, is not a Christian guy. I mean, I, I'm just trying to say that. Our people do not have adequate knowledge of the Kurukshetra. We do not have enough understanding of many, many generals that are fighting this on many fronts, using many kinds of weapons. And so Witzel is one guy, he's pretty old now, in his late 70s or something like that. There are a lot of young people into this uh, from the Western side and the Indian side who are anti-Hindu. And uh, then there's Freudian stuff. Then there is this new Hinduism, my new book. Uh, Indra's net talks about this whole uh, school of neo Hinduism, which these guys have the, the people you've named have nothing to do with. These are these are whole entirely different group of thinkers uh, who have uh, come up with the neo Hinduism thesis. And ironically, our uh, groups, Hindu groups like uh, Dharma Civilization Foundation, funding these kind of people, uh, sponsoring some of the people who are who attack the philosophy of Vivekananda, funding some of these people. So the confusion on Hinduism is huge. And, and therefore, because our people are not well read and not taking the time to understand the big, uh, vast Kurukshetra, they tend to fall into the uh, let's hate one guy, let's, they, they tend to need a one liner, one bad personality, one devil kind of person, and everything goes at him. This is a silly idea because personally it's not true. And, and the problems are many more. The, the, the people who are doing these things are far more than just one person. And there are many kind of ideological fights against our culture. And it's also not a good idea because you will not win this way if you keep the, if, if you focus on one person and become very excited about fighting one person and you really don't want to understand the big picture. So I don't I don't like the thing that all our problems are solved if you go after this Mr. X sitting somewhere. And by the way, in Harvard, he's a non-entity. So all these petitions to the Harvard dean and Harvard president by some of our people are so stupid because he is hardly an entity. He's just almost finished. He's retired pretty much. And nobody in Harvard thinks that much of him anyway. There's many more important people today who are live, active, who are running around and publishing things and organizing things and producing PhDs. When was the last PhD that Witzel produced? You should know. Have you read in the last 10 years any doctoral dissertation that was produced under him? So I don't want you to get carried away in a very narrow battle on one with one guy when as the problem is actually much wider. Uh, Rajiviji, we have called two other callers and uh, Bhardwaj, uh, thank you for the call. And uh, so we have two other callers. Hello, hello, caller one, go ahead. Thank you. Hello. Hi, hi, Rajivji and hi, Mohanji and Banerjee Namaste. Namaste. Yeah, my name is Rajita. Like, I, I have a simple basic question. I often get confused uh, between, um, like, people say Hindu Hinduism is not a religion, it's just a way of life. And what's your opinion on it? Well, this, this oh, thank you, Ajita, for the call. Yeah. The question is, people say that Hinduism is not a religion; it's a way of life. I don't want to give an answer which I already given because in the book Indra's Net, I explain why this business of way of life is a silly idea. I mean, there is a, a dogs have a dog way of life. So what exactly do you mean a way of life? Eskimos have an Eskimo way of life. Taliban has a Taliban way of life. Al Qaeda <laughs> is a way of life. The drug culture is a way of life. The 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 people who are uh, mafia is a mafia way of life. Every living being, any any life has a way of life. I mean, cats have a cat way of life, and mosquitoes have a mosquito way of life. So when you say it's a way of life, what exactly do you mean? I mean, you have to tell me specifically what is what 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 particular way of life qualifies as him. It's not that it is a way of life. It, it, to say it's a way of life is like saying a, a car is a collection of molecules. Well, so is a banana and so is a computer. <laughs> <laughs> so so to, to say that a car is a collection of molecules, of course it's true. But what particular collection of molecules makes it a car and not a bicycle? Okay, so Hinduism is a way of life. But what particular way of life, what uniqueness about it makes it Hindu? 
as opposed to Taliban or Al Qaeda or or Christian way of life or you know whatever way of life, other ways of life. So it is a moron answer. It is a really stupid kind of a. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but this business which a way of life is for people who do not want to study what kind of way of life it is. You can ask me any question, and I could say it's a collection of molecules. If you're asking me about a physical object, if you ask me what's a computer. I could give you a moral answer saying it's a collection of molecules and I'm not wrong. Yeah. So if you ask me what is the the uh, such and such ideology and I know nothing about it, I still say it's an ideology. But what kind of ideology? So it's a stupid <laughs> thing. And I, I really take this apart in this book Indra's Net. Okay. I have lots to say on this, why it is wrong. I also criticize this Vasudeva Kutumbakam and this all, all the all the parts are the same and whatnot. You have to these are uh, I'm writing a book called Moron Smithy in the future. Which is the smriti on how to be a moron, and I come up, <laughs> and I come up with you know ten things morons say, and each one of them is like what are the popular things morons like to talk about, and this is one of those. Then it's a way of life without being able to answer any further what way of life you're talking about, and you know Hindus have been started th without thinking, just kind of parroting silly things like it's a way of life. It's a it's a quick cop out for a person who doesn't know a darn thing, because if you know nothing, you can get away by saying it's a way of life, sir. <laughs> Ajita, you 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 got a, a good answer to give anybody who says that to you. So thank you for the call. We have two other callers in the line. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, whoever gets the gets to hail us first will get the dibs. Hello. Hello, caller. You're on air. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Ismail Penikanda. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, we have uh, Raju ji listening to you. Ismail Khan. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Dr. Raju. Um, uh, my question. Uh, uh, no, no, I, I do. Uh, Ismail. Pinukonda. Okay. Ismail. Yes. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, actually, I come from. I mean, I just want to give you a little. I'm an atheist right now, but uh, I was born Muslim. Um, but I come from an area in Rayalaseema in a part of Andhra Pradesh where millions of people who are, I think, Hindu were converted to Muslim, uh, Islam religion, at one point of time. Um, I, I, if I go back to like four generations, I think most of them followed some uh, saint or something like that. For example, right now it's Sai Baba, Shri Sai Baba, maybe that time it's Baba Fakhruddin in our area. Um, but the thing is, they are Hindu at heart, but uh, they, they practice uh, Islam as a religion uh, for other sakes, like birth, uh, you know, the marriage and all that, death and all that. But what what is the um, scholars, uh, the Hindu scholars, think of them? Like the people who were there for thousands of years, born there, um, you know, the sons of the soil, who were, you know, choose a, a religion for whatever reason that may be, but were truly uh, Hindu at heart. Okay, this is a very good question. I want to summarize and then I want to answer. It's a great question. The gentleman who's asked the question uh, was born a Muslim. He's now an atheist uh, from Andhra Pradesh, and he says millions of people there who were converted to uh, Islam long ago, generations ago, are Hindus at heart, uh, uh, but they follow Muslim uh, rituals and Muslim procedure, Muslim weddings, and so on. And uh, these people who've uh, traditionally been Hindus but for a very long time have joined another faith. What do we think of them? So this is, in fact, in the book Indra's Net, I discuss this very thing. I discuss what are the thresholds, what are the thresholds when you stop being a Hindu? What are the issues? What are the ideas which t take you away? See, if you if you can't accept reincarnation, okay, uh, because Islam prevents you from uh, establishing, uh, from uh, accepting reincarnation. If you can't accept that uh, there have been many avatars, because of, uh, th those are not listed in the Islamic book of prophets and so on. Uh, if you can't accept that the divine, the supreme being, can also be worshipped as feminine, because in Islam it's only masculine. Uh, if you can't accept that you can worship formless, like Allah is worshipped formless, but you can also worship form. Uh, 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 we do not have this injunction that uh, uh, the, uh, that these are false gods and you can't worship them. So if you can't if you can't accept any of our deities, any of our deities as forms that we can worship, okay? And if you can't accept the idea of Shakti, is immanence, the divine presence here in the world, through human beings, through objects, in, all, in everything, everything is, a, everything is a divine manifestation of Shakti. If you can't accept these things, 
then it then you know the point is that you do not you, you are not within the space that you could be saying i am a hindu you may be walking barefoot and wearing saffron and and eating paan and you could be saying i have bindi on and i do bhangra and i i do some uh, i have a hindu name uh, you could be you could be in the pop culture a hindu a hindu by pop culture but you are not hindu by deep culture and you are not hindu in the grounding of the of the things that matter so you are part you are you, you see Hinduism is an open architecture. Hinduism has no problem accepting people who have many, many different points of view. But the others who are join, who are in joining the open architecture, have to leave it open. They cannot close it by saying we are the only exclusive. We have an exclusivity claim. You can only worship this way. You can only uh, accept this particular history that happened in the Middle East. You can only worship pointing towards Makkah, and no other worship will count. I mean, the exclusivity that comes with certain religions. typically the abrahamic religions have this exclusivity and uh, finality and closure uh, requirement in them because they are history centric and i have explained in my books what is meant by history centric because they are history centric they tend to be geography centric they tend to be deity centric they tend to be book centric every one of those is exclusive one of a kind absolute so when somebody from a closed faith uh, comes into this open architecture they harm the open architecture because they they cannot they cannot accept the open architecture the open architecture is willing to accept them provided they themselves are open so the issue of compatibility uh, between hindu dharma and islam or with christianity is not a problem on the hindu side the hindu side is willing to say uh, we accept your uh, worship of your, uh, your anything even in the temple you can come and do that worship if you want but it has to be reciprocal so many times Christians tell me that okay, why don't we accept each other? I tell them the following: All right, we will put Jesus in the temple as a, one of the many deities, and you put Durga and Kali and Shiva and Krishna in your church, and they run like that. They can't. <laughs> they can't accept it. So you see, the reciprocity of openness is very important. Okay, and and uh, the problem is that so so these people are Hindu at heart, but they should understand the point I'm making. they should understand the point i'm making they should go back to their imams and challenge them and ask them that here we are in a civilization for thousands of years our ancestors have been here that is so open that is giving us this uh, tell, giving us this offer and challenge that let's be open on both sides why aren't we able to respect their deities why are why are we uh, required to call them false gods why are we supposed to smash their idols because we have been told not to allow that we don't have to worship them let them worship them let the hindus respect their their hinduism we don't have to convert but we should respect them so all i'm asking is that the the muslims who are willing to have mutual respect are of course w- welcome they are wonderful people and we should be hindus respect them but the muslims who are closed who believe that they have a finality they have an exclusivity claim and others are false i think they are they are they are not really good for the open architecture so i'm be quite uh, honest about that and i uh, i mean if you if you have a comment on this as a follow up i would welcome to hear that okay uh, uh, i think uh, yeah. if you have any follow up uh, please do say ismail are you there ismail dr ismail yeah uh, we have two other calls i think looks like uh, we uh, dr ismail is uh, cut off uh, uh, the call is dropped Uh, hello, caller, you're on air. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead with uh, Rajiv ji. Hello. Uh, hello, I'm Pratish Sir Sagar. Sagar, go ahead. Uh, Where are you I'm, calling from, Sagar? Uh, as Rajiv ji mentioned, that there is a good culture going on, and there are a lot of pradams and like a uh, lot of wars going on. I'm uh, I'm read well. you their books like being different breaking in the i mean the abu groups i read those because but what if uh, uh, like i want to be another raju malhotra like uh, what should i do because reading these books will only lead me to like tackle or debate with my friends or uh, to some extent but if i want to be a pradhan from the hindu dharma side or the dharma philosophical side what should i do to be a pradhan because i i i mean uh, Uh, guy of an age 29 to 30 okay. i want to continue all this doing and like okay very good so i will repeat the question this, this gentleman who is between age 29 and 30 says 
he's read my books he's read invading the, he's read breaking india being different uh, and one or two others and he's in my yahoo group and he's convinced of all this but he says how do i become a pradhan how do i become a leader how do i become like you how do i make a difference besides just my uh, achieving knowledge for myself what do i do so this is excellent i i love to hear such people and uh, i'm glad that uh, you have you are you are inspired to do all this it depends on the answer depends on what your capabilities are you should be consistent with your capabilities if you are able to organize a forum if you are part of a forum and you are able to organize a uh, forum can i interrupt you a second sure. could you please for those of you who do not know who is a pradhan leader okay okay i mean you know head like head. pradhan mantri is a yeah, okay leader. i mean is there a specific uh, that that he wants specific to be a label okay he wants to be a hindu leader okay, let's right. just put in a general way the intent the spirit of mm-hmm. is not the literal meaning but the spirit of his question is he wants to be a hindu leader mm-hmm. so how do i be a hindu leader he wants to know so i am saying that if you are part of a hindu organization uh, you can convince your guru you can convince your guru to invite me i would like to come and discuss with them how their whole organization can be expanded i'm not going to argue against their philosophy their theology their rituals their bhakti and all that Uh, i respect that i respect it for all the hindu sampradayas but i can add some another chapter i can add another dimension to their knowledge and through that organization i can have a force multiplier and more people can be on this wavelength so if you are part of a local hindu temple or a ho- local organization you can do some work for me by organizing events over there and bringing their senior leaders on on the uh, being able to listen to me at least if you are part of a civic group a political group which is open to dharma open to new ideas you can talk to those leaders and say why don't we introduce this kind of a discussion if you are part of a university and you have some clout and you have some friends you can ask the university to invite me so three of the major Uh, channels that i feel are very important one is the uh, hindu sampradaya channel second is the civic group or political group as a channel and the third is a university or an academic group if you if you have access to any of these three then you can help me get into that particular mode uh, then there are people who can who have resources there are people who say okay i will fund i am going to fund and, uh, and organize the telugu translation of your works or kannada i mean i have kannada people i have marathi people i have hindi people so you could take on some projects like that you could take on a project which says we will cl- make clips of your youtubes and make more targeted small message youtubes and we create a small group of people who will be doing that and putting them up you can do that for me there are people in social media who can help me uh, you see there are so many ways of helping uh, but what i would like is that the person should think where he is capable of helping so he is not disturbing wasting time just making noises for his ego and not able to deliver you have to be sure where you can deliver and and i have no shortage of people who want to help but the pro- question is can they really come through with their promises so you have to do the soul searching on what your strengths are what your resources are and then write to me privately saying this is a very exact specific proposal i will make a commitment to it and then we can take it seriously otherwise i get you know 100 emails a day literally offering me all kinds of useless advice or offering me all kinds of help which they can't come through with even the most basic thing i ask them to do they can't do it so it's a matter of what you are serious about your level of commitment and where is your specialty that you can perform let me uh, uh, tag on to that uh, uh, sagar's question and that what are the inherent qualities of somebody who like uh, to do something and make a difference in the sense not necessarily look for leadership but do what is important is that the uh, yeah, asking would, you yeah it's good question but i would say there's many kinds of people there's people in the social media mm-hmm. who are saying basically we want to support you in the social media and they are very helpful to me mm-hmm. uh, they are they are uh, they're getting me a large uh, audience because of the mainstream media boycotted me and blacklisted me and they try they see me as a threat mm-hmm. because uh, i'm count- i'm countering their uh, their icons and their big shot li- uh, hindu writers and secular writers i'm countering them in a way that they can't uh, address they don't want to debate me mm-hmm. they can't dismiss me they can't say that he's some radical guy and he doesn't know what he's talking and and he's talking about wrong things because i don't do that my my books are exceedingly solidly written and they can't counter that mm-hmm. and so what they can do is just sort of ignore me like i don't exist because they don't know how to deal with me mm-hmm. so this social media is a very effective weapon which is working which mm-hmm. is working like crazy mm-hmm. uh, and 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 i need help in that now they don't have to be a big leader intellectually they can just help me in the social media if they are 
scholarly oriented person they can help me in my research in my scholarship if they are a person who have language skills they can help me by translating mm. if they are politically connected or a leader in a local kind of an organization they can invite me they can help me in that way so there is many i would say there is many types of jobs we have <laughs> and many uh, it's like a huge thing where we need people of many jobs yeah know? well but there's one other point what attributes do you anticipate people would have to be the next rajiv malhotra Oh, I think you need to you need to be an intellectual who likes problem solving. You need to be a creative person. Uh, you need to have uh, put aside all your basic life needs and uh, young enough, not when you are very old, but like in my case, around in my mid forties, I put aside everything and went to do it full time. This requires full time. You have to be dreaming it. You have to get up in the morning and until you sleep, you have to be thinking about it, researching. You have to be a good researcher, a passion for reading. a passion for debate a passion for engaging uh, all kind of ideas and not be narrowly defined saying i only read these texts because they are my texts you have to have an appetite a voracious appetite to read i go on a plane every time i go on a trip to india i take three four heavy books with me and this 14 15 hour trip by the time it's done i've marked up all the important things i've typed them up on my laptop and i'm ready with a a 20 page a summary and review of each of those three or four books and so i have read a few thousand books like that over the last uh, you know so many years and i i have digested it i can quote my sources so when i'm arguing i can back up my arguments that is why they know uh, people who have taken me on then they know that uh, if you take him on he put even more ammunition he dump out even more ammunition and eventually those guys run away and so the 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 uh, you, you have to be somebody who can not just start a fight but sustain it not it not just be somebody who sh- gives a one liner and then runs away you have to be able to stand your ground you open a war you have to stand your ground and not run away so this requires courage it doesn't it, require guns though it uh. requires courage it requires <laughs> it requires clarity uh, you have to be able to take a risk yeah. you have to be able to say okay if i if i go out and take this stand people are going to accuse me people are going to uh, spoil my reputation they're going to go after my image but so what i don't care so you have to be thick skin also and uh, be a risk taker So there's a lot of different qualities uh, that you need. Yeah, we uh, we will take one more call and then uh, continue with a few other questions I have. Uh, uh, hello, caller, you are on air with uh, Rajiv ji. Go ahead. Can you first tell your name and who, where you are from, where you are calling from? Hello. Hello. He's trying to say something. He's trying to say something. We can we cannot hear you. Uh, Kiran, okay, the call call got cut off, and uh, let's um, uh, let's have a um, let me continue with a few other uh, things here. Now let's get a little bit from deviated from uh, Hinduism, Hindu dharma, and all that to a little bit into the politics of it. Um, you mentioned something about Arab Spring in a uh, couple of days ago in one of your uh, one of your broadcasts, right? And uh, you are expecting something so, some something similar to arab spring and what you would call is india spring uh, could you could you elaborate a little bit more on that and uh, for yeah i'm worried i'm worried that uh, you see you have an old order mm-hmm. and you want to create a new order mm-hmm. but between the old order and the new order is is a process of uncertainty confusion chaos dissolution shiva mm-hmm. yesterday was shivaratri mm-hmm. so shiva dissolves the old and creates the new the transformation shiva is the transformer from the old <coughs> old stable system to the new stable system mm-hmm. old equilibrium to the new equilibrium so if india wants to break down the old equilibrium which is corrupt which is got which is very bad for india and majority of india has understood that this old order has to be uh, disrupted the point is you do not want to disrupt it create chaos that you don't know how to control so arab spring was youth people who broke the old order because the old order was corrupt and bad they they broke the old order but they had no expertise no management skills no governance skills to create a new order so uh, the arab in the, those countries where the arab spring happened are neither here nor there they don't have the old dictators which they wanted to get rid of but they don't have a new governance either so they are basically anarchy civil war lot of uh, radical groups fighting each other that the nation is being taken apart uh, all the countries are falling apart so it's a great opportunity now for westerners to come and intervene in the name of human rights and the russians want to come chinese all the arabs everybody all the neighboring countries and other world powers want to intervene 
and these countries may be broken up. They may be uh, in the next generation lost uh, fighting <coughs> each other. So I don't want India to end up like that. This means, uh, you know, Gorbachev, Gorbachev was against the old guard, but was not able to keep control of the country after he started these forces to unravel the old guard, old way of Soviet thinking. Mm. So the country fell apart. The country broke up. So India faces that risk of ideologues and uh, young people with good intentions breaking the old system who do not know how to control and put together a new system. Which is why I think your, Modi is a very unique kind of a person. He, he, he can disrupt the old system because he's a tough guy, but he also has governance expertise to create a new system together. And this is the reason I, I like these Aam Aadmi Party ideologically. They're very nice, they're very well-meaning, and, I, I, and one part of me likes that, and, and I hope that it, they are successful in a local state level so that in five years they could be a, they could be worthwhile at the national level. But I think they're not ready for the national level because right now in the national level uh, they would uh, it would be a kind of a disaster. Uh, can I take a call? Okay. I, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Hello. We I'm will. On the air. Are you asking me a question? Well, I'm on the air. You can tune into my show. <laughs> okay. So somebody who had your phone number and uh, was able to ask. Okay. Well, uh, we I'm have. Asking, the, asking them to call in here. Okay. Uh, uh, the person who just called uh, Rajivji, you can call this uh, 2013401950. Actually, I wanted to get to some of the questions I have. We have a couple one of questions. Facebook. One from Facebook. Uh, uh, Hanu, can you come to close to the microphone and ask that question? <laughs> yeah. All right. uh, this is from Nitin Sridhar, and his question is, how do we revive this Indian education system for the sake of creating Indian narrative? Okay, and he adds that like our Indian narrative is Mimamsa, Sankhya, Veda, Vedanta, and how do individuals can contribute in these fields? Let how me, we, yeah. yeah, yeah. Let me also ask that. I have a question on that one, so it's going to slightly deviate from the, sure. uh, slightly deviate from the politics. But we'll get back to politics, the Hindu narrative. And you mentioned something like the great Indian narrative. So let's say, uh, are you uh, saying like Hindu and India is the same, or uh, in, is that is that the message here? Hindu narrative and the Great Indian narrative, so are are one and the same. And the second, what is that Great narrative? Yeah. So I've described this also. <coughs> I call it the open architecture. Mm -hmm. But to me, what is distinct and unique about Indian civilization, mm -hmm. Bharati Sanskriti or civilization, mm -hmm. is it's an open architecture where many kinds of people, many languages, many ethnic groups, many ideologies, many ways of worshipping, many ideas of divine, you know, male, female, no form, whatever, all these are allowed. Mm -hmm. So it is the most open system. So you can call it by whatever name, I call it open architecture. In this book I say, okay, now let's not give it brand names because then people get biased. Let's mm -hmm. call it an open architecture. It's mm -hmm. like the internet. Mm -hmm. But on the internet you cannot be somebody who's subverting and sending out viruses mm -hmm. and trying to bring down other people mm -hmm. because then they should throw you out. Mm -hmm. So it, on the internet you can be as, you can do anything you want except bring down the internet. Mm -hmm. You can't be defeating the internet and being in the internet, otherwise it's self-contradictory. Mm -hmm. So anyone who respects the openness of the internet is welcome. So similarly in this open architecture, the only people who are culprits who ought to be gotten rid of are those who are trying to bring down the open architecture mm -hmm. by being closed, by being like a cancer that wants to spread and force everybody else onto their wavelength. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that is the, uh, what I call adharma. So for today, my definition of adharma is anyone who wants to subvert and disrupt and destroy the open architecture. So to me, the Indian narrative must start by appreciating this is like the core engine. This mm -hmm. is like the engine inside, mm -hmm. you know. This is the central idea of open architecture as dharma <coughs> and, and, any, uh, and anything that is closed architecture, expansionist, exclusivist is a dharma. So let me put a couple of words in your mouth in yeah. there. Tolerance and acceptance. Uh, mutual respect. Mutual respect. Yeah. Tolerance is sort of okay but not good enough. Like I tolerate you but that doesn't mean I respect you. Uh -huh. uh, you wouldn't like someone to say, I'll, I, you come to my house and I'll tolerate you to sit and have dinner with me. Uh -huh. You'll say, what the heck is wrong? Why you have to <laughs> I mean, imagine in the office you tell your colleague, I'll tolerate you to sit there. Uh -huh. Or you tell your spouse, I'll tolerate you in the house. Uh -huh. It's not respectful. Uh -huh. It is disrespectful. So the word tolerance is a Christian word because they were actually had, ex each kingdom in Europe had its own denomination which was a law. Uh -huh. They had one particular kind of uh, denomination that you had to worship in, uh, we joined uh, this particular church uh -huh. and people who joined another church were banned and it was considered criminal. 
So that exclusivity, they decide to have a, a, a political treaty and a military treaty between two kings, mm -hmm. saying, I'll tolerate your people in my kingdom and you tolerate my people in your kingdom. It was more like kind of putting up with you. Yeah, okay. We're not going to kill you, we'll, we'll tolerate you. But <laughs> we, we, we need to go better than that. We need to say that we need to have, so in my book, Being Different, I explained that, that tolerance is not good enough, we need mutual respect. Mm -hmm. So the open architecture is like that. Okay, uh, so the in, in terms of great Indian narrative, you uh, I remember you mentioned the other day about having you said there is this Western narrative is that they imbibe a lot of the uh, Western narrative in, imbibes the very young about the history, culture, and art and everything. So I actually wanted to uh, I don't know where I put the quote. Uh, most recently, I saw the movie. Um, was it the Monument Man? In that, you saw the movie. No, I haven't seen it. So actually, there is a, you. You probably will enjoy this. Yeah, like I, you, 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 you have some, you have some very good lines in that. And I, I was thinking about those lines when you were talking. I mean, when I was watching your uh, video on that, it says like uh, when uh, Hitler decided to destroy. Uh, so I mean, he just collected art, and then his sole goal is to destroy all the people he conquered. And uh, is as if those cultures did not exist and all. In that context, they say why it is so important about these monuments and museums and why people have to relate and all that. So is that uh, something? So, so let me just tell you, without, I haven't seen the movie, but actually Christianity has done that. Mm -hmm. Christianity has destroyed so many places where it went. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Native Americans. You know the huge cathedral in Mexico City, which mm. is one of the World Heritage Sites, huge uh, Christian cathedral, mm. when they were doing some basement renovation, they mm. found that it was built on top of, an Inca, of a Native American temple. Mm. Okay. So it reminds you of the Ram Mandir issue. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it, the church was built on top of a Native American temple, which is a pagan temple. Mm. So now when you go to this huge cathedral, on the side it says, uh, they don't give it much publicity, but on the side it says if you want you can go down, down, down and go down the steps and uh, they will give you a guided tour of what this huge temple was. Mm -hmm. You can see the foundation of that old temple on top of which the cathedral was built. So this is a symbol of what the what has happened, how Christianity has spread and similarly Islam. I mean the point is why are there so many great Hindu temples in south but there is nothing in the north. When you see so much of our culture from you know, the, the Vaishnav culture and the Shavite culture all in the north so much, where did all those things disappear? And you keep finding that archaeologists once in a while when they dig very deep they find some Shavite thing or when they find some old goddess thing here and there. Obviously these are conquered lands that have been eradicated from the past. So, so why does the Abrahamic religion have to eradicate the past? Because of this I explained in the concept of history centrism and the concept of exclusivity mm. and the concept that God is outside and is not inside. The world is not imminent, but he is transcendent, and therefore he has sent only very few prophets. These prophets are finished; they are not going to be coming anymore. These prophets, the line lineage of prophets is closed, and we we have the particular book of what this is about, mm. and only we can then tell you. So this kind of an exclusivity, uh, we don't have that because uh, because God is imminent mm. everywhere. Therefore, new new rishis keep coming, new people keep coming within the insights. So we have modern people. We have Raman Maharshi. We have Sri Aurobindo. We people can follow. We have Ramakrishna. So we have an ongoing refreshing of uh, the knowledge mm -hmm. uh, because we are not uh, limited to uh, a closure of uh, historical prophets. We have an ongoing enlightenment mm -hmm. potential. That's because all of us have, have such a mm -hmm. potential in us. So there is a metaphysical and cosmological and philosophical difference. Mm. So the, the religions of the Abrahamic philosophical idea mm. uh, will not be able to accept uh, those who are not fitting their uh, idea. Mm. They, they, they can at best put them in a museum. Mm -hmm. Museum it means you are dead and now we will stuff you and preserve you and put you in a museum. Mm -hmm. Now all wouldn't like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, none of these guys will like to be put in a museum. Yes. Uh, you want to be living. So they, they, well, India doesn't have a museum need because we never put people dead, kill them, put them in a museum because mm. they are living. Mm. They, are, they have a living culture. They have their own temple, their deity. You go to any uh, part of India, uh, there will be a little goddess mandir. Mm -hmm. I went to uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, Nagapatinam during mm. the tsunami. I went to the, all these places. Even the ones who converted and whatnot, unless the church comes and the, when one, after a while the church comes, want to throw out all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But they, secretly, some guy in his house still kept one. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. you know so and you'll find that even <coughs> even though they don't know what it means mm-hmm. because uh, of this idea of secularization the education they kill the actual practices uh, so but they still respect a place mm-hmm. uh, if you tell them i want to see your deity mm-hmm. they will after they trust you that you're not some kind of a, a human rights guy who's going to make fun of them mm-hmm. after they start trusting you they take you to their deity mm-hmm. and then you tell them explain it to me then they will be very shy they say we don't know but then some old guy will come and tell you what it is mm-hmm. yeah so this india has been a land of little all kind of deities every village got a village deity who protects that village and that is what what their essence of identity is mm-hmm. now this uh, living faiths of huge pluralism mm-hmm. you do not find in the in the abrahamic religions they can at best turn this deity freeze it and make a monument out of it and make a museum out of it and and but they cannot there's no active worship going on Uh, I mean, not necessarily everything religious. I mean, by monuments and all that. So, what, what about cultural? So, people, writers, and poets, and kings, and all the all the uh, intellectuals. Yeah, I think the, the, that they, they they really have done a very good job of uh, creating a grand narrative of history. Like you go to Washington, you see all these monuments. You go to various state capitals mm-hmm. in the United States, you see monuments. You, the night the big parades in this country are very patriotic so the symbolism and all of that with some a lot of exaggeration the grand narrative always has a lot of exaggerations and the founding fathers and how great they were and all that is part of the american grand narrative mm-hmm. and there's absolutely no doubt that they've done a very good job i commend them for that every nation has a right to do that india needs to do that but india has not done that because the intellectual wallas of in india are very and they are in very complex and when i talk about what is the indian grand narrative i'm not pushing a grand narrative on them i'm asking them to think about it mm-hmm. many of them are scared of the question mm-hmm. i find that a lot of people in india the intellectual types on especially the on the extreme left they're very scared of her because they they haven't answered they haven't figured it out for themselves so, so they are uh, accusing you for asking a question yeah on the same same uh, subject you know uh, i come from the state of andhra pradesh what was the state of andhra pradesh uh, what is it now oh, I, i don't know i don't know this the ident- identity identity issue so having these uh, these symbols the cultural icons on tangband area yeah and in one um, oh, one december i think it was a december so sometime so they kind of had a very preplanned well orchestrated so a bunch of thugs they would like to call them uh, freedom fighters or whatever they, they, they whatever the narrative they give but i call them a bunch of thugs so under no cameras all these cultural icons have been destroyed with very pre-planned way why uh, have they done it uh, i mean i i just want to know if you followed that why would you think that that is uh, i mean what, what do you think of it first well i think if people are destroying cultural icons uh, maybe they are threatened by what those icons represent mm-hmm. and maybe they represent a certain cultural continuity mm-hmm. which they are threatened by mm-hmm. and they want to create a new uh, you know new history and so they want to erase the the, the evidence for that mm-hmm. so uh, that is probably why they would do it uh, so people who are intolerant uh, are the types who would destroy what is there i think it is very it would be very un hindu to go to any part place and destroy their deity or destroy their local heroes or their sense of who they are i think it would be very uh, Wrong. Okay. Uh, well, I don't want to belabor that point because that's that has been a subject that comes keeps coming on my show quite a bit, the Andhra Telangana. So, um, the so let's get back to the uh, politics of it. The coalition parties. You said, uh, uh, well, uh, I don't exactly remember the uh, conversation uh, you had earlier on this one, but center versus states. This is something I believe that. too much power in the center is not a good thing so what, what do you what do you I, 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 what are your thoughts on it so? i agree with you i think that there are that the state should have more power mm-hmm. i think the center should control things that keep a nation together mm-hmm. you know currency foreign policy military these kind of things you said the mm-hmm. center should control but give the states a lot of autonomy a lot of freedom as long as they within the constitution of india they're not doing anything unconstitutional or provoking uh, you know hatred for e- each other there should be a certain uh, decency towards the nation and towards the unity of the nation and towards <laughs> india's grand narrative they should have a thing like that uh, but then within those uh, overall broad uh, ideas they should be able to function autonomously they should have to go to delhi for permission to do this or that certainly business commerce economic relations those kind of things 
uh, the state should be able to pretty much do on their own. And right now, the taxation is a very big control the center has because you pay tax to the center most of the time, mm -hmm. and then the center allocates the money to the states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, here the states have to raise their own taxes for budget purposes, mm -hmm. state budget. So I think it should be like that. The center should only uh, raise the taxes it needs for uh, center's projects. But the state should raise their own taxes. That way, they don't have to depend on the center. Right now, there's politics. If the state government is run by an opposition party compared to the central government, then they will not be favorites to get the money. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, the, through control of the money, they can manipulate the democratic process and the vote banking, which is all unfair. Uh, you you want to give states their own political freedom, their vote banking freedom, kind of thing, and their own financial freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but they should operate within the the integrity of India as a is, as a country. Uh, in, in terms of small political parties, uh, regional parties, uh, w what is your opinion on that? Well, I think that too much fragmentation uh, is dangerous because you have a very difficult uh, you, you have a very difficult consensus process with there's a lot of people who have to sit around the table and reach a consensus. Mm -hmm. uh, ideologically, yes, it makes sense that a lot of people everybody's voice is considered. But then, as you know from any enterprise, if your committees are huge number of people sitting on a committee, you never get anything done. Mm -hmm. So a large part of India's problem is that to keep these coalitions together, a huge amount of energy of the government in power is spent just keeping the coalition together, keeping everybody happy. And then the little parties know that they have a lot of power because they can do something and bring the government down. Mm -hmm. So they, 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 this encourages corruption. So somebody wants to be railway minister, somebody wants to be this ex-minister, Y minister, mm -hmm. uh, in exchange for the support he'll give. And the reason he wants to be the minister is not because he is an expert in that area, but because there's corruption opportunity. So briberies and corruptions are one of the motives that bring little parties to exchange their uh, support for uh, some power. And then that power can be monetized. You can monetize the political power into corrupt uh, corruption opportunities. OK. Do you have a call? Uh, no, we didn't have a call. So. Okay, uh, on the same same part, uh, the center versus state rights versus uh, regionalism, or the regional identity, or the ling linguistic identity. These are the things that that keep coming up prominently in the backdrop of Telangana, separate Telangana agitation. Uh, we're all the same. Integration is say. I am. I mean, uh, everybody knows who my regular listeners know that I'm an integrationist, and I say like we are. The same people, so we should be together. That's that's my that's uh, that has been my stance forever. And uh, no, we are different. We are different in this, 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 and and from from my perspective, they are not the differences that they really were not there. And if they were, they were artificially created for political gains. That's my point of view. But what has happened in 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 terms of this is all, in my opinion, has. Far-reaching consequences for in India and what happened in Andhra Pradesh in the last. Two. I'm, I'm sure you've been following what is happening in there. So far-reaching consequences, something like, yeah, it was done for political expediency, or the electioneering, or whatever you want to call it. That's nobody with any. Everybody with an iota of sense would realize that Congress Party has broken the state to gain some MP seats in one part of the state. And even the person who's behind this split of the state is saying, "Oh, I'm not. I don't believe in it. I did it because Sonia Ji said told me to do." Jay Ram Ramesh. That's what he was saying. So, in general, this uh, breaking up of Andhra Pradesh in the manner in which it was done, and uh, what is your take on it? Yeah, I think that uh, the problem in India, all over the place, and maybe it's, this is the latest evidence where it's happening, is that. Uh, uh, to be corrupt, I need to have a local vote bank. Mm -hmm. Then I can go t trade it in and do a transaction and get some uh, power out of it. Mm -hmm. And to create the vote bank, I have to show that uh, this group of people, I'm going to represent you. You are victim. Somebody else is, uh, is uh, oppressing you. Mm -hmm. India has oppressed you. Some caste has oppressed you. Some Aryans have oppressed you. Some uh, group people from another state have oppressed you. Some I have to show that you are victim. This idea of, uh, of championing victimhood is a very negative thing. It's mm -hmm. a very dangerous thing because you have to order it's negative. You always have to do it by showing atrocity literature. It, it is India's own atrocity literature against other Indians. This mm -hmm. is the problem. Mm -hmm. So local vote banking thrives on constructing atrocity literature against your fellow Indian. Mm -hmm. And th this, the more successful I am, whether I'm a Yadav somewhere, whether I'm, a, you know, uh, you know, whatever, Mayavati somewhere, or whether I'm a, 
Jailalita, or it is all the same. I have to sh I have to con uh, convince my constituents that you are different because you're victims. Those guys are the problem. I'm going to save you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to champion you. I'm going to get better deal for you. So all the problems, all the poverty, all the issues that local people are facing uh, can be turned into some kind of a manipulated history that shows that you know others are to be blamed. And uh, then the person gets power like that. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, probably one example of this sort of process. Going on. No, I, I understand that it is uh, it is an example, and it is World Bank politics. There is no doubt. But the w what is the end result of this process? Like it will, it will go on breaking up and breaking up because if you have then then in Telangana there will be some guys wanting A versus B and break it down further. There is, you can keep bifurcating. And uh, you know, even these states in India are tens of millions of people. There's large states, so you can keep breaking them because you know you take a state, and you break. I believe in small states for governance purposes, mm -hmm. for practicality of governance purposes, mm -hmm. not for ethnic violence or for ethnic uh, conflict. It should be you need small states because they're easier to govern, but you do not need to break them up on the basis of some kind of animosity with other people. Is it uh, fair to assume that you are against the way it was done? I do not. Well, first of all, I'll say. I'm not. This is a topic I have not kept up on, and mm. I probably should read up on it. Mm. And I prefer to take on very strong. I take strong stance, but I do it after reading and studying a lot all the positions. I haven't done that on this one, mm. so I'm giving you my general thoughts and my positions. But I haven't really studied honestly on this. One. So he, my my what if you want to call it an intellectual argument on this one is breaking India, and you see external forces, and I see internal forces. And they're both there. The the I see the internal forces are much stronger <laughs> in in breaking India in than in certain places maybe yeah in certain, maybe in this example they're stronger but in the Maoists somewhere mm -hmm. are getting a lot of help from Nepal which is linked with China now and I know that this whole uh, in the south they are getting a lot of uh, see the, some of these ideologies be they left wing ideologies or right wing ideologies are important mm -hmm. North East is a certainly uh, is a lot of stuff coming from Bangladesh and China and uh, 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 Western churches in the Northeast, the, mm -hmm. the three great civilizations of the world, the West, China, and Islam, are competing for the Northeast. Mm -hmm. Northeast is the crosshairs of these. It's the war zone. So uh, uh, we, we can take some more calls, Anish. Actually, so one question. Uh, one question from Facebook. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it is. Uh, can, you know, can, the same thing. Yeah. Uh, he basically said you haven't answered him, which is the. How do we create Indian narrative in the current education system? Yeah, I answered his question. Okay, so uh, in the current education system, you will not be able to create. So what you need is an HRD minister who understands the importance of the Indian system. Uh, and I would not want to throw out the old, the current system. I would want to add more subjects. I would want to change history how it's taught. I would want to include comparative religion, not promoting one religion over another, but teaching them what it is so that people can have facts and they are not manipulated. I would want to introduce yoga, meditation. I would want to introduce our values, Indian traditional values. I would want to uh, basic, and I would want uh, you know places where people can go. Uh, you know, IMAX theaters where they teach, they show you this in an entertaining way. Monuments. Uh, you know, I would want a uh, uh, lot of uh, not just classroom technical uh, theoretical knowledge, but online stuff and places where kids can go and get inspired. But so, uh, so I would, uh, I would say that these are things which are visionary. It's, you know, individual can do only so much. A lot of individuals are trying. Uh, you have uh, various Hindu organizations and various other kind of organizations starting schools here and there. But to really change the nation, you have to change the media thinking. You have to change the civil services the thinking. You have to change how Indian foreign service people are trained, how IAS people are trained, what sort of knowledge they get about India. You go to some of these government of India sites, they're talking about RN theory. You go to who gets these presidential awards, these Padam Shiri, Padam Bhushan type awards. Many of them are being given to Western scholars who are Aryan Dravidian divide kind of people. They're hmm. getting awards, so, government of India awards. So you know the government is government is actually championing a certain uh, idea which is a breaking India idea. The government through the kind of awards it gives is championing. Okay. So the, there is. A... I would say that government of India after independence has done more harm. To the sovereignty and integrity of India, in terms of its narrative, in terms of its culture, in terms of its integrity, you know, intellectual unity, done more harm than the British. Did. Which specific government? You mean which prime I minister? I would say all of them. I don't think that the BJP government did much that was sustainable 
to uh, uh, along the lines of what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I think that uh, I don't want to say that they fail because all I can tell you is that other than in making India a nuclear state uh, official, it mm -hmm. was already a nuclear state. It's not that they made India a nuclear state, but making it uh, uh, making honest and open about mm -hmm. it, which is not irreversible. It is irreversible. Once you've done it, you've done it. Other than that, I don't know what they did, which is uh, which wasn't reversed. And th there are things you can do, such that even if you lose power, you can't reverse. Mm -hmm. You know, but they didn't do those kind of things. So I, I so there's nothing sustainable today, which you can say it's their accomplishment. Okay. So I think that they governments in general have not been able to do. They that. took it up on the textbooks, changing the textbooks. Yeah, but the the way it was done leaves a lot to be desired. It, the enough uh, it, and how to change? What are the first areas to change? Where do you tackle it? You know, you need to. Your first line of fight has to be such that you have a high chance of winning, and then it has to allow you to open up for the next fight. Mm -hmm. So instead of starting with, for instance, in the colleges, instead of starting with let's teach astrology, they should have started with let's teach yoga and brought the medical establishment of the whole world on their side. They would have gotten uh, much more success if they brought in uh, our tradition and our values through the health benefits of yoga, like Ram Dev is doing, mm -hmm. and put that into the whole system and say everybody must learn that. Once they've started learning that, then once they've got the health benefits, then you can take them to the next step. Yeah, actually, uh, there are a couple of callers. So callers, so we'll get to that. Uh, get to one second on the yoga subject. So there has been Fox News. Um, uh, they they uh, they went on a rampage against uh, yoga as a, some kind of a Hindu imposition on uh, Christian faith or something like that. So we will get to that a little later. We have a couple of callers on the line. Hello, caller, you're on air. Uh, go ahead with your question to Rajivji. Uh, hello, this is Rajivji. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Namaste, uh, Rajivji. Namaste. Uh, I just, uh, I'm a big fan of yours and I've read all your books. Uh, just not when, that who's, who's calling? What's your name, sir? Where are you calling from? Sanjeev. Uh, this is Sanjeev. I'm calling from Bangalore. Okay. Sanjeev from Bangalore. Welcome, Sanjeev. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. So, um, actually, I have been reading Upanishads myself, and I have uh, kind of, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm on the same line, sir. Uh, I'm too small to say that, but it is great to be interacting with you. So, um, when I went to the last Mahakumbh, actually, I found out the same uh, which is really great, but I think it's lost in the modern world. That is, we used to have shastras over the text, and we used to do a lot of modification as to uh, what needs to be done. Uh, so, with your kind of uh, with your kind of knowledge, I just wanted to put across a point wherein I know that most of us uh, would like to get into the same lines of knowledge as you, but many of them are lazy enough to read the books and 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 this entire gamut of books. So is there a possibility that maybe with the help of internet, like the Twitter or the Facebook, we could organize a Mahakumbh of uh, a knowledge sharing session? Because I believe that when we do Shastra, a lot of people with their kind of confusion, it comes up. And then uh, with you as the sitting host, I mean, um, maybe I'll write you in, 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 in private over emails or something. But oh, I just, well, yeah. Okay, so I'm, 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 very, I'm very impressed. This is a very good idea, a Mahakumbh on, uh, on the internet. So why don't you write to me and volunteer? I'll I'll be there. You invite me. I'll be there. But you know, you organize it. You do the tech work. You write to me, and you must then make sure you come through and not just talk about an idea and run away. Now I have a tweet that needs to be. He says that can you please ask Mohan Professor Mohan to repeat the number one more time? So maybe some you. So phone number is. Uh, 2013401950 if you are calling from united states and if you are calling from india 0406677 here is a, here is a funny thing about it already phone companies have started charging roaming in andhra and telangana oh my God. <laughs> so so this was uh, this is really hilarious. Uh, uh, anyway, so if you even if you are calling from uh, the one part of Andhra Pradesh, so if this is a Hyderabad phone number zero four zero six six seven seven eight four zero three, and uh, in US phone number two zero one three four zero one nine five zero. So yeah, uh, you go ahead, Ji. Rajiv. So the question. Uh, 
Although you answered that. I answered the there. question. Uh, uh, he wants a Maha Kumbh online. Oh, okay. You, you already answered. Okay. This we have another. Very interesting. We have one more caller. We have one, one more caller. I, I have a funny take on it later on. So, uh, caller, go ahead. We have another caller. This is uh, Virendra. I'm calling from Phoenix. Okay. Hello, Vijay. Glad of you to hear from you. Uh, so you often talk about uh, grand Indian narrative. So, is there an idea with you uh, that to approach government uh, to put something like that in execution, especially assuming that Modi is going to come into government? Okay. So, the question is, uh, have I put some? Have I put a proposal to the government to put something into motion uh, along the lines of my uh, Indian grand narrative kind of a vision, uh, and especially Modi is into power. Uh, you see, the thing is that I've been championing this for 20, 25 years. I have written a lot. I have a lot of uh, proposals, a lot of ideas. If invited, if invited, that I'll underscore, I'll be more than happy to do my part of it. I do not want to lobby. I'm not a politician. I, I feel uncomfortable going and trying to you know, work my way through some very complicated system I don't understand. I'm not a party insider of any party. Uh, there are, and you see, the thing is that there are, there's petty politics in every party. Uh, there's people who want to be important. There's people who want to outsmart you. There's people who want to take your idea and take and move it forward for their own progress and keep you out of it. They're threatened by you. So all this jumping around, running around, politicking is is uh, is there in every large corporate organization which I worked in. That's why I left the corporate world to go out on my own because I could not stand this uh, corporate politics. And this is also party politics. This is also in large religious establishments of every religion. There's politics among the people to why to why for position, jockey for position to try and climb upstairs. So I don't want to be part of that game. I will not uh, <coughs> subject myself to going running around uh, trying to lobby that I have to do this or I have that idea. I am a thinker. I'm an independent thinker. I will remain that. I will uh, continue my research, writing, and uh, public uh, publicly championing the ideas that I have. If somebody wants to benefit from my ideas, if somebody wants to invite me, a government of any kind, I am not. I have not uh, closed the door. Never closed the door for, to the present government. If they wanted to invite me, plenty of those people know me. I mean, I have known some individuals who are in very high position, uh, who even like my ideas, but felt said in the current government. Who, who said that uh, they can't uh, afford to take the personal risk and stick their neck out and champion these ideas, but they privately agree with me. So there are people who support these ideas in all sorts of uh, uh, parties. But uh, I, as far as you know, I'm not going to be getting into the dog fight because it is a dog fight to pull an idea through or to put an individual through. I would not do that. Uh, and so if I if none of this happens, uh, then you know it won't happen. But others can champion. I, I mean, it is for the Hindus who are interested in these ideas to do some of this championing of what the right ideas are and uh, and so forth. Uh, I, I I have not done anything of my own with uh, to uh, position myself uh, or put forth a particular concrete proposal of any kind, and nor do I intend to do so. Okay, uh, we we have a few couple of more callers, but before we take the call, I want to uh, I want to put a plug in here for Taranga for those of you who are new to listening to Taranga. Taranga has been uh, uh, operating as an internet radio, and uh, we do a lot of other social uh, social media. We have a lot of social media presence actually. We have integrated internet radio and social media uh, through an app, uh, which can be downloaded from Play Store. Uh, actually, the, our iPhone app is not as robust. Uh, we run channels in Telugu and Hindi, and of course, as you can see now, even though this is uh, Telugu only, uh, I mean, uh, most of my shows are on Telugu only, but uh, as and when the situation needed, we, uh, we do shows in, in uh, Hindi and English as well. Uh, actually, we do have a separate Hindi channel. And this uh, Internet Kumbha, the knowledge transition, this is not like a one uh, concentrated effort. This is essentially a whole bunch of intellectuals do a lot of intellectual shows on this one. With that, shameless plug gun um, uh, has been done. So we'll take a couple of calls. Uh, hello, go ahead, caller here on air. Hello? Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, sir. You're on air. Well, uh, first, uh, tell your name and uh, what's your question. Okay, my name is Ramesh. I'm 
my question is why there is a brain drain from india and why governments are not taking any steps to prevent that brain drain okay what's your name and where are you calling from sir uh, uh, my name is venkat i'm calling from bhopal bhopal okay okay so venkat from bhopal wants to know why is there a brain drain from india and why is the government not doing to stop it mm. i think uh, I think the thing is that if the Indian education system improves and there's more research opportunity and there's more meritocracy, less corruption and less petty politics involved, people feel they have more freedom. Then people will want to work in India. And but I I think that the brain drain is not as much a problem as it used to be. But now there's a lot of brain brain returning to India. A lot of Indians have returned back to India. Mm. And I think the uh, what you're calling brain drain can also be seen as a brain development. It's uh, the brains are being developed in foreign countries. because a lot of the people who go as they can they have access to laboratories and research and and so on and many of them do things and come back so uh, in this global economy there is be people traveling back and forth india must india must be a knowledge society knowledge economy knowledge exporter and it therefore needs world class uh, institutions like nalanda takshashila all these kind of places were at one time so that it is it is as prestigious as harvards of the world and bringing people not only from indians staying in india but also people from around the country around the world coming back to india it is sad that in the uh, ranking of top 100 universities you don't find indian university now some of them complain that the ranking is unfair maybe it's unfair but even if the ranking were different only a few might make it and you go to iits they're not doing research they're just teaching i was recently at iit kharagpur and the students there told me they agreed with my description that they are training you to become tech coolies i use the word tech coolies that you know even the biggest tech companies in india are not really producing the uh, original software we do not produce the uh, the uh, you know these uh, apps we do not produce what whatsapp for example with 50, <laughs> 50 ukrainians on food stamps delay i mean out of the top 100 apps on iTunes and the top 100 apps on uh, uh, on uh, this uh, Samsung uh, you know platform the Google platform uh, uh, you do not find that many indian manufacturers but we are we are the brick layers we are the brick layers uh, like poor people from a village come to delhi and they make a, a house for a rich man they are brick layers and when the house is made they don't own their own equity they do not own the single brick which they have laid they go back to the next job and the next job so they are they are people who do not own capital of their own and similarly the uh, people in india sitting and working for microsoft or working for any of the great uh, google they don't own equity in those things uh, so infosys people like infosys are a large supply they are doing labor arbitrage they are taking low price labor and selling it to a high price market and making money for themselves and a few small number of them become billionaires and we think they are big sharks but actually is no different than uh you know if you, uh, if somebody were bringing cheap labor from a village in india and selling it selling drivers and maids and selling cheap labor to a big market in delhi or bombay and they could get a cut out of the margin of labor rates and they can end up becoming very rich but they are not really uh, doing original work so i think that uh, this uh, we have to learn from china they also started with low uh, low wages arbitrage they started with that in the manufacturing sector but they didn't stay there they went up the value curve and they's now started taking over the pc market and with their own brand enovo and now they are taking over more and more consumer electronics market they are soon going to come with an electric car and take on the american electric car people so they are not just content being cheap factory worker workers they are creating their own original brands and getting into the international market uh, in a very systematic and a very powerful way you will see in the next 10 uh, years chinese brands taking over many many kinds of markets so uh, india hasn't done that and then this is this is an inferiority complex that we are not good everything comes from overseas the you know the the uh, aryans came from somewhere else and brought us sanskrit and vedas then the greek came and brought us astronomy and uh, and philosophy and mathematics and then the you know the muslims came and they brought us sitar and chicken tikka and <laughs> and, and, and tabla and and they brought us taj mahal and then the british came and they gave us railways and they gave us mathematics and they gave us cricket and now the americans will give us human rights okay this is <laughs> I, i i call this the invasion theory of india and the reason people don't like my grand narrative project is because it devastates this invasion theory of india it says that we have our own narrative and it is not a narrative of foreigners coming and fixing us and improving us and now we uh, sir i want one lady in one of these uh, very high flown internet in indian think tanks in delhi mm. when i was talking about the indian grand narrative her counter position was that you know we have all these problems 
and so many people came and invaded us and did so much for us, but we still have these problems. Sir. So I said, then what you are really saying is we should better get invaded again, <laughs> because because these invade, invaders, we thank these invaders, they did not complete the job. They are we should score them and bring them back and say you guys came, you invaded us and did so many things for us, but you have to come and do more. So we should send a demand to them to get more. Yeah. That is what Ram Mohan Roy did. He wrote a letter to the British asking them to come and fix India's education system. And then uh, a decade or two later came uh, this uh, whole uh, Macaulay type people. Indians with the inferiority complex are are the ones to blame. So you know what you what you have is a very complex vicious circle. You want government to do something; it is very necessary for government to do these things. But then the government is basically reflecting the views of the people. The government is elected by the people. It is not some dictator from somewhere who fell from the sky. It is the fault of the people. Either they don't vote at all because they don't have time, or they vote on based on emotions or misinformation, and so we end up with a government, and that government perpetuates the inferiority complex of Indians, and then we are dependent on foreigners to solve our problems, mm -hmm. and so this is getting worse. So what you need is to revolt against against systems that kind of uh, position Indians as inferior, and you want to uh, demand that uh, we need creativity. So the IIT Kharagpur people. Who invited me to make a keynote address? The students were full in this audience. Mm -hmm. Not one professor said anything. He just said quietly because mm -hmm. it is protocol. This guy has come from America. They have to be there for protocol reasons. <laughs> All the Q and A was with students. And when that thing was over, the uh, professors quietly sneaked out from the side. Students stood around me, signing my I was signing my books, and they said, "Sir, we totally agree with you. This is exam-oriented institution." We are we are basically passing exams, and then we sit for a GRE to go to America or to get into an MBA program. We sit for this GMAT or whatever. Uh, so it is it is our own exams, and it is the American exams that we are prepared to pass. And so we are measured based on how good we are and what is our ranking uh, in the American exams, so that we can go somewhere else. We and we are tech coolies. We are not being taught original thinking. We have very little uh, uh, you know encouragement to really come up with innovation. I asked them. Why don't you have an incubator in Har near Harvard? There's an incubator in New York. There's an incubator, you know, near every major university because universities are not just teaching; they're also doing research. And graduate students are part of doing research. Around the university, they have these incubators, business incubators, where people with a great idea. Some people even drop out of college; they have great idea, you know, and they or or they finish college during college, they are developing an idea. There are these business incubators. Now these are venture capital type of people, angel investing type people. Why don't the billionaires of India go to the top 50 colleges and universities, and next to each of them create an incubator and say, "We will encourage with angel funding. We will encourage our young people to stay here, and we will seed them." Why don't they do that? I mean, why aren't the Indian uh, media who think they're very smart? Why don't they demand these kind of things? Why aren't they doing intelligent investment? Not here, P ratings in it. Huh? Not here, P ratings in yeah. it for them. Yeah. So, so this is the thing. The you, the the Indian billionaires are not doing put, uh, lifting the weight that they are capable of that they are funding to do, and the, it's the Indian population and the Indian public and that have built them up. Otherwise, they would be nobodies. These guys, most of them, would not if they had no money and ended up starting up in the Western world, would not have built up so much. They built up in India because it's a huge market. So they owe something back to the community, and and it would be a big deal. Why don't Tata say that in 50 universities we're going to set up incubator, and each university uh, we will put up X uh, uh, thousand crores to set up incubator, and we set up hundred ventures uh, per university, hundred spin-off ventures per university. So even if five, ten, fifteen of them become like the next Google or the next uh, WhatsApp, we'll have created something. Why don't they think like that? Okay. That's the, that's yeah. the problem. Yeah, we, we have. We'll take one last call, and I have a, a couple of uh, closing questions, and a very important question. I'm holding it till the last. So the st uh, show ends at uh, 2 p.m., and we we will be leaving in a hurry. So and therefore it will, it might even uh, end about five minutes earlier. We'll we are taking one last call. Hello, caller, you're on air. Go ahead. Hello. Okay, uh, there are no calls, or I think the last caller dropped out. So I I, I uh, wanted to uh, follow on with your being a professor myself in the Macaulay system. Uh, actually, in in U.S. there are a lot of incubators. Actually, even our university, George Mason, has incubators. 
they're not doing as well as some. I mean, Silicon Valley has an entirely different culture New, as opposed. New York has, good New, New York has a good, Harvard good culture. Area, Massachusetts area. Is yeah, yeah, I I work there too. Um, I mean, in that area. I mean, I meant to say, uh, it, it's it's funny you you mentioned the you coined the phrase tech coolies, and I call them glorified clerical jobs. As uh, most of the IT jobs are like that. Um, the product is like you're playing mostly a support role, not necessarily an innovative role by itself. And those who are innovative, uh, they're not risk takers. Yeah. Not, so something like that. The, the risk and innovation, they have to go together in terms of like, uh, otherwise uh, things will not go forward. So one, one last uh, comment I wanted to ask you earlier. Wendy Doniger, uh, banning of her book, uh, what, I mean, basically, you're opposed to that. Yeah, I, I think that uh, when you ban a book, you are giving ammunition to the other side to make it prestigious and more important. And because, uh, you know, if you ban a movie, everybody wants to download it. There was this uh, mo video that went viral because, uh, what was it, uh, this Paris Hilton, some kind of a sex movie about her some years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And so they said ban it, and the, her, her PR people wanted to withdraw it, and everybody was tweeting it and uh, forwarding it to each other. So when there is something sensational, exciting, banned, uh, you know, this gives is, more publicity. Gives more publicity. So, the, and the, this negotiation, which they did, I mean, I support the uh, the Hindus who did whatever they did in good faith. I mean, I'm not against that, but I'm just trying to tell you what's the consequence you know, of even acting in good faith. What sometimes the consequence is. So, the, uh, the, the 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 negotiation they did only asked the Penguin of India to withdraw it, mm -hmm. not Penguin of US. It was originally a US book with an Indian edition. Mm -hmm. So now the uh, US book, uh, publisher is going to dump thousands of, tens of thousands of copies in India, which there is no ban against. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is no and there, there is no retraction from any Doniger herself. Mm -hmm. So she's on the radio, she probably write more books. So uh, this is, so what you've done is you won a small victory uh, uh, and, and created an opportunity for a bigger defeat. Mm -hmm. It is like that. In, in a game of chess, you've taken a small piece, but you're going to get more fire by coming back at you. Mm. So I think that the strategic thinking, uh, my approach would be very different. My approach, what I suggested is, I want debate. I want to demand debate. I want the equal time for my book. Mm -hmm. I don't want Wendy Doniger's book of the year because my book is devastating to her. My book is, if my book had an equal opportunity to be heard and discussed and debated, they cannot answer those questions. So Wendy Doniger is, I had put a pressure on her mm. uh, and she was not a very big deal in the American Academy based on after after my pressure. She, she was not able to get students. She was very few people going and working on her, uh, under her for a PhD. Mm. And in the academic world, she was kind of sidelined. Mm. She's become like a kind of, a, okay, she's had her time and she's gone. Mm. And she was also in semi-retirement. So I had achieved that, not by any ban or anything like that, by putting out very heavy scholarship, pointing out page by page what is wrong with mm. it. And this, of course, woke, uh, scandalized her incompetence. Mm. I would rather expose her incompetence. Mm. So what happened now is to make a comeback. Mm. She could not fight me in the US uh, in, th in terms of debating, and she still won't uh, respond to any calls for debate. So what she did is she got hold of the Indian left. Mm. Indian left and she aligned, because Indian left needs ammunition against Hindus. And Indian left don't have their own scholars. They don't know Sanskrit. I'll try to call her on my show, and if she comes and uh, be a surprise caller, and then see what she what she does. So we have the, the, one the, one last question so coming. I, I, would, I would just to close a thought on the on this uh, <laughs> issue. Mm. I would say that when Hindus are facing an issue uh, against somebody, uh, first you need to get some good top scholars. Like I, the work I did on Wendy Doniger and various other issues, you need and on neo Hinduism. Neo Hinduism, the next frontier. I want Hindus to help me take on those people. Mm -hmm. So we need to have someone do the good scholarship, and then what the community should do is popularize that work, read that work, make it mainstream, and and ask for the other side to challenge them to come in up and uh, discuss it. Mm -hmm. That is putting us on high ground. That we are the intellectual of the world, our, inter our intellectual output is better than theirs and we want to discuss it. Mm. And so why are we being boycotted from the mainstream media? That is what we should uh, demand. Mm. And not that their book be banned. Okay. So I would have fought the battle in a different way, but at the same time I respect those who did what they did because that is what they chose to do. They have a right to do it. They, know, they use the Indian legal system which everybody has a right to use. They are not to be accused of doing anything, anything, any hanky-panky or any threat. They didn't do that. They are very civilized. They followed uh, the court system, and uh, th this is the result that they were able to get. So I respect it. 
Okay, uh, one last question from the Facebook and uh, no, uh, the evidence of the Aryan invasion theory. People say the 1500 BC. <clears throat> there are clearly the people who are living there in the agrarian society are different than the people who moved in. And how do you change this? Like in the books of the history, it's all there. See, there are certain chronologies which people assume. People assume that agrarians become city dwellers. That is an assumption because that is what happened in the West. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we, we have such a pluralistic system. We could have it's such a huge continent. India is such a huge continent. You could have many simultaneous groups emerging. You could have a group that picked one model and they wanted to have a, a kind of a city or model. You could have another group of very intelligent people who live as forest dwellers who are looking, going the inner inward journey. Inward. Yeah, you could have a composite society where certain people are of a certain type, like we have, you know, certain varna. Mix. So people of a certain uh, varna who are going into a certain dimension, they come back once in a while and teach, and so their symbols are also found there. And there are other people who are rashias and other kind of people who are organizing and they are more you know, corporate people and business people and they are creating the harmony. So you can have many. Why is it that all Indians have to be one kind at a given point in time? See, they are assuming that all Indians were type A. Then, then, then they had to become type B, all of them. Then all of them had to become type C. So this is a story. This is how they are creating their own story. The Western story is being built like linear. One A leads to B leads to Do they have Sanskrit knowledge? Of course they have knowledge. In the so, sense, chapters okay. and everything? No, the, yeah, yeah. the people who are, the people who are Indologists for the last 200 years have mastered our, our Sanskrit, but not as practitioners of meditation. So there are certain, there's Sanskrit that you can read as a text and intellectually, but there is Sanskrit that you can do the mantra idea of embodying it and getting the sense of it as an embodied knowing. That they don't have. So, therefore, they don't have the correct pronunciation, they don't have the experience, that's why they're not loyal to it, but it's a piece of scholarship. And I call it like a, a person who's never eaten a certain cuisine, he's read the recipe, and he can analyze the recipe. Or a person who doesn't know how to play music, but he's read the notes, you know, he's read the musical notes, and he's analyzing it, and he become an expert. So, they are expert from the outside. We're no, not expert, no. it's not an inner experiential expert. Okay. That's the thing. So we have one last caller. Uh, caller, make it quick, and uh, we uh, we are just about to wrap up the uh, wrap up the show with one last question from me. I'll, but first, take the caller. Hello, caller, go ahead. Hello, uh, hello, Professor Mohan, and Namaste, Rajiv ji. Yes. Yeah. What's your name, and where are you calling from, sir? Oh, this is Hari, and I'm calling you from Bangalore. Okay. Uh, question is uh, to Rajiv ji about uh, uh, his grand narrative of India being applied to the Indian society. Uh, I, I, I work with a lot of counselors and at least over the last uh, week half a dozen psychiatrists who teach counseling to us tell me uh, that many psychiatric problems in urban society in the urban society of India is due to the uh, Americanization of India. Uh, the young people here are sort of trying to take up uh, an American dream to their life and that's causing, that, that uh, schism is actually causing a lot of uh, psychological stress and that is leading to a lot of other problems. So uh, yeah. my question is, will this grand narrative of India also help us creating an Indian dream? Because we don't seem okay. to have one. Okay, so very good question. The, very good question. Gentleman from Bangalore is saying that he has a lot of psychiatrist friends in India and they're telling him that one of the reasons for a lot of psychological disorders of young people is that they are trying to uh, download an American mind. Uh, I'm using my word. Uh, he said that they are trying to Americanize India and Americanize their experience in India. And I would say that they're trying to download an app called uh, Let's Be American into an Indian, onto an Indian platform. And then the, and then the app is a disruptive. And the app is like a virus. It will disrupt the platform. So the app platform also becomes an American platform. Mm. So, but the, but the hardware is an Indian hardware now running an American platform. This, and this creates a psychological disorder. I, I'm just paraphrasing and restating what he just said. That a lot of the psychological problem is because these are Indian people and they're not really Americans, but they want to pretend to be Americans. And this is creating a lot of psychological disorder. And he wants to know if the Indian grand narrative will also will, uh, uh, help in this respect and restore some pride and so on. Of course, that is the whole idea. And this uh, this business of being mixed up, uh, this business of, uh, you know, like in the, under the British times, there would 
uh, be kind of Indian inside and British outside, and then they would be mixed up inside also. Uh, you know, yeah, and then they would not know who they are. Then some of them would, some of the people would think we are the British only. We are the we are the Gora Sa, We are the uh, the brown Englishmen here. And all this kind of a thing is based on inferiority complex. So uh, I'm not I'm not for isolationism, by the way. I'm for Indians to be very confident using modern technology, engaging the West, speaking English, understanding American history. Uh, going to uh, you know uh, American uh, uh, lifestyle, cop, uh, pop culture, all of that I, I want Indians to be able to do. But deep, deep inside, you can have an engine which says Indian inside. Okay, you can have a you can have a foundation. You can have your deep core be based on our our civilization and our Sanskriti. So the Indian narrative has to achieve those kind of things. Okay, uh, thank you for the call. Uh, I I have one now. Uh, one last question, which is very important for those of us who are uh, Indian Americans, what what you say is that HR four one seven, which is is has this been passed already. No, no, okay. HR four one seven is uh, in in, a sh in short, it, it it starts something like this: praising India's rich religious diversity and commitment to tolerance and equality, and reaffirming the need to protect the rights and freedoms of religious minorities. So this uh, uh, two or three pages of a resolution, which is actually this is not a law actually, uh, per se, it is just a resolution condemning uh, a few things in India which they, are, they have no business in doing in here. Sir, go ahead and okay. say what so, this is and what we can do. Yeah. Those of us who are Indian this Americans who are waters. Point. Very good point. I'm already working on this. By yeah. I, I'm very personally involved in this. And I want, I'm glad you raised this uh, uh, reminded me. Hmm. HR 417 is a typical result of what I earlier called atrocity literature. Hmm. So these people have been fed so much atrocity literature which is self-serving. They are the ones who funded it. They're the people in India who are funded have supposed to uh, toe the line and come up with some atrocity stories so they keep doing it. And there is the US Commission on Religious Freedom which keeps compiling this. There are all kinds of government agencies, uh, church agencies, think tank agencies, left-wing uh, scholars uh, involved. These kind of people have been putting together a massive atrocity literature and in Europe also they're passing some laws, they're passing resolutions. So this resolution basically targets Gujarat without naming it. It says there's a major state whose chief minister has committed pogroms and they has committed all this uh, genocide and holocaust and violence against minorities. They, they are, they're, uh, they're referring without naming. If, if, may I, if I may interrupt, who's behind this? Okay, so this is the same people I have named in Breaking India, the book mm -hmm. Breaking India. It is the same nexus, the same people who are involved in Breaking India are also involved in Breaking Modi. This mm -hmm. is the Breaking Mo uh, India being uh, manifesting itself as the Breaking Modi because they feel that if Modi were to come to power, he'll expose his Breaking India nexus, he will go back, he'll put us on a Making India project and this Making India project will be devastating for these Breaking India nexuses. So that being the case, they are fighting this. They, this is the, the timing of this is also because of the Indian elections. They want to show the U.S. is against uh, Modi uh, and uh, and can try to influence election in India. Now this is this should be attacked by Indian Americans on many levels. Firstly, you are interfering with another country, which is a democratic country, which we consider to be an American ally. And this is a stupid American policy to to do this because it's going to backfire. Uh, you know, Modi came into power. This is going to backfire against the Americans who have done this, and they'll be eating their words. Right now, they don't want to give him a visa, but then they'll be bending over backwards, begging him to come here because well, Modi has got many other important countries to visit before the United States. It's the United States that want him to come here. So, given the corporate interest, American interest, given the military American interest, uh, foreign policy interest in India, to boycott somebody like that would be an absolutely suicidal thing for U.S. policy, and the Americans would never want to do that. So this is a bad idea. It's also wrong ethically and wrong in terms of uh, interference in another country where there is a rule of law. And the, the Indian constitution and Indian courts are the ones who decide. It is not the American public opinion, media and all these nexuses and radicals who decide what is right and what is wrong in India. It is the Indian courts who decide. And the Indian courts have not pronounced Modi guilty. Whether, so you can't say that Indian courts are therefore no good because they didn't do what we wanted them to do. That would be that would be kind of a foreign imperialism or a foreign attempt to colonize India. And every self-respecting Indian American should say, I do not want American interference in India. 
because whether if whether a guy person in india is guilty or not is for the indian courts to decide i am not taking a stand for or against modi but i am doing it as a matter of principle for india's sovereignty india's constitution india's legal system and india's legal system has worked on this case after case for 20 years they, they it's not like nobody has fought cases so the 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 the, the point is uh, that it, it is unnecessary interference and it's an insult to uh, I, I india now what we can do is we should lobby our local congressmen we should lobby our local congressmen we should lobby our local senators i am doing that i have had four or five people who were previously favoring this who dropped out okay i have names of some of these congressmen i have i have i have i have the main members of the congress who are on the list of the names and even if he, if the name is not in this list anybody who is an indian american who has who votes here even if you are not i think you have to be a voter right to write to you have to be a citizen you have to be a citizen but so, even, but uh, uh, even non citizen are donating you are allowed to donate up to certain amount so you are yeah. making contributions so, so you have a voice whether you are a citizen whether you vote or not you are the point is they're looking at you for money and so you have a voice and even if you don't vote or give money the point is you have a voice uh, on the on the uh, based on what's morally right based on free speech based on what is good or bad politics you have a right to intervene and and uh, and you know go against this kind of a very stupid resolution okay uh, uh mr pitts uh, ellison uh, chaber conyers sensen burner mcgovern wolf who is my my congressman uh, sires meadows moran uh, hulls campbell lewis mccollum uh, grigel grigel um uh, police these are the sponsors of this bill and i think we should uh, you should write to your congressman and they said this is whether you are for modi or against modi it is totally irrelevant here and this is the idea here is united states has no business in interfering in indian affairs and that is a stance that uh, all of us who are indian americans should do and if if you if it adds ask these these guys to tell that you are talking about some killings in uh, in gujarat way back in 2002 since newtown there are 12000 deaths that happened in this country gun deaths and tell the congressman why didn't they pass a resolution against gun deaths in an america why didn't they pass a resolution against christianity as uh, the civilization of this country wait why are they blaming hinduism yeah. and why are they blaming government and why, i mean when the courts have exonerated why, why, why you know if you applied the same Uh, rationale to the united states there would be a lot of resolution here yeah so with that said uh, thank you all for the call uh, for all for the calls and for thank you for tuning in it was born my my heart and thank you so much sir rajiv ji for and coming I, and, I, and i would like to have uh, internet kumbh melas internet kumbh melas and i want uh, to start internet kumbh mela uh, movement and i actually will might help you on that okay <laughs> so i can i can help taranga can help and then we'll talk more about it Good. and thank you and signing off from washington dc this is uh, mohan venigala and i will see you in my future broadcast you know this show comes every friday at 12 pm eastern time which is going to be about 9:30 pm pretty soon in india 9:30 pm every friday in india pretty soon thank you so much and uh, ciao talk to you later bye